Thank you. I just lost my headphones, so I lost the last... Uh, hello, sorry. Right. The translating thing, there was some frequency interference, so I lost the end of that, sorry. But the, everything I heard up to that point, I got through Red Hot Chili Peppers, was interesting. Um, so, hello. Koiso i baub. That means uh, welcome all in Welsh, because I'm from Wales. And I've just realized I'm not sure how I'm going to do this, because I need to hold a microphone. I've got a little clicker for this. That's me. And I've also got some words. So I'm not sure how I'm going to do this. Do you mind if I... Oh, no, it's OK. I'm going to... I'm going to... Are you going to stay there? Oh, no, no, because I need to read. But um, I thought I'm a bit worried. I'm going to do some walking about, because I just... I don't know. I, just, I would rather you all looking at the screen and not looking at me. I feel very self-conscious. So um, let's just see if this works. So this is me, although it's a bit of a lie, because it was taken about four years ago. Um, and there's my contact details and things if you want to get in touch. Now, can you read that? Because that seems very blurry. Can you read that? No. So this might not go well. Let's see how we get on. I'll send you the slides afterwards, uh, so you can read it afterwards. The idea of this, we're not going to dwell on this too much. My, I'm going to talk for about half an hour, about 30 minutes, and I'm not going to give you too many facts and figures, and all the facts and figures are going to be at the start, so we'll get the boring bit kind of out of the way. And this bit was just to um, give you a sense of what the UK music industry looks like in terms of organizations that look after it. So we have a, we have a body called, the, called UK Music, and that is a small team of people who represent the entire UK music industry. And their job is to basically, they, they live in London, they sit really near our government, and their job is to lobby our government constantly and say, we need you to do this, we need you to do that, can you do this, can you do that? and also to talk on behalf of our sector. So that get, get, you know, talk to kind of one voice for everybody. Um, so that the, the government knows that our industry uh, is a big industry, it's important in the industry, and it needs, you know, what kind of support it needs and, and how it needs looking after. And this side, which I can't read, and neither can you, will tell you all the different other organizations, so not the companies even, just the organizations that make up the UK music industry. So um, there's a group that looks at this PRS. So PRS are an agency that um, collect money on behalf of artists when they get played on the radio and in, in concert halls and in gymnasiums and in hairdressers. Um, and they're one organization that look after all pretty much of the songwriters and the publishers in the UK. And they are one of these lines. And then you have different bodies that look after different areas, looking after BPI, which looks after the entire recorded music industry in the UK. Um, and you, so you have all these different organizations. And then below, beneath them, you obviously have the actual companies themselves. So you might have one of the organizations here is called AIM. It's the Association of Independent Music. And that looks after m most of the independent labels in the UK, of which there's over... AIM represent about 1,000 labels. Um, and they, they think there's actually another 2,000 labels that aren't even their members, that are just people run, you know, putting out records um, and don't want to be part of a bigger body. And AIM, you know, one of its members is, the, is Beggars. XL is the label that looks after Adele and various huge artists. Um, and they're just one of the lines here. So we have this kind of... We have organizations that look after different areas of the sector, and then we have an organization that looks after the organizations that speaks to government. And that's been a really, it's a relatively new initiative. It's only been around for like six, seven years, but it, it means that the industry sort of speaks with one voice, and, it, and that's quite an important thing when you're trying to get yourself heard at government. And on this side, this is all like recording uh, and performance and, uh, you know, like uh, broadcasting and all that kind of side of things. This side is the live industry side and the various bodies that look after the live industry. Um, and that's made up of, well, well I'll send, send you the things afterwards. Which way do we go? Right, so Simon mentioned these figures just at the start. And so this is just to give you a sense of what, how big the UK music industry is. And this research has all come about from UK Music, and it's been really important because it's, 
um, kind of given everybody, including us working in it, a sense of like where we sit in terms of um, our status within the UK. Um, so the data, basically the figure that you need to know is here, is that it, music is worth £4.1 billion pounds to the UK uh, economy in 2015. That's when the research was done and this report came out last um, September. And it supports about 119,000 jobs. As I said, five of the world's top-selling artists are British. Uh, I can't vouch for the quality, but they certainly do well with the sales. And they generate 2.2 billion in revenues, in export revenues for selling abroad. Um, so this is just to give you a sense of, of that 4.1 billion, like how does that sort of spread between the different parts of the industry? So the people who make the music, musicians, composers, songwriters, and lyricists, they're worth about 2 billion, they're worth about half of that. Live music, which we'll come on to, is worth nearly a billion, 904 million. Recorded music, 610 million. Publishing, 412 million. Producers, recording studios, and kind of management and staff and all that kind of thing, 120 million and 92 million. So you can kind of see the big, the biggest part of our industry is in um, actually making the music. And then when we come to export, how does that music split up? How does that uh, money split up? So again, most of it's going to the artists and the people who make and create the songs. Uh, people who represent the publishing of the songs and the performance of the songs. And then some record sales. Uh, and then we kind of work our way through. And then live music. So, and this is the bit that we're going to move into because this is, this is what I do. The total audience for live music in the UK was 27.7 million people, with 24 million attending concerts and 3.7 million going to music festivals. So that's a lot of people. It's um, about 40% of our population, of our entire population. Um, but obviously, most people who go to concerts are sort of 14, 15 years older uh, uh, and older. Um, so it's a huge sector, and festivals in particular are a really growing area in the UK. So, I haven't looked at my notes yet either. Um, so, yeah, this is the UK, guys. And this is, just in case you don't know, because I'm sorry, but I, like, I had, I've never been to the Ukraine before, and I've never been to Kiev before. I'm loving it, it's great. Um, but I have to look at a map to try and work out where everything is. So just in case you don't know, where Wales is. This is where I live, down here. So we're the bit next to England. Uh, and I picked this particular picture because it makes it look like Britain's really hot and sunny, which it's not. Um, so this is where I work. And all my work is pretty much in Wales. So Wales is, um, there's a, there's a because Wales and England used to fight and used to go to a war, there used to be a, 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 a line there, and we used to battle with the English, but we don't battle too much anymore. So I work in this area. That's me. And this is the company that I run. I run a few different companies, but this is the kind of thing that I'm going to talk about today. So I run a company called Soon which is pronounced soon, uh, and it's the Welsh word for sound. And that's, what I, that's where uh, I am. So let me just tell you a little bit about soon. Soon began, I'm just going to read from my thing, when I took my first proper steps into the music industry uh, just over 10 years ago. Myself and a BBC Radio 1 DJ called Hugh Stevens set up the Soon Festival in Cardiff in 2007. We were inspired by trips to places like In the City in Manchester, uh, South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, Oya Festival in Oslo, and Iceland Airwaves in Reykjavik. We went to these amazing dynamic festivals. Uh, they were big and small. And in these towns and cities, we wanted something really good to happen in the city where we lived, which was Cardiff, because nothing happened in Cardiff. Um, so we made our own version of these festivals and we kind of built it to the canvas 
of Cardiff, and we loaded it very heavily with the music from Wales, and we called it Soon. Soon is a multi-venue new music festival uh, with an audience of about 3,000. People buy a wristband, and they run around uh, and go and try and see as many new acts as they can. This is what it looks like. This is last year's festival. Somebody nearly bringing the lighting rig down. Um, when we set up Soon Festival in 2007, there was only one other wristbanded festival in the UK uh, that we knew about anyway, and it was one called, uh, it was in London, and it was called the Camden Crawl. So we accidentally found ourselves at the start of this sort of city festival format. So we've been running Soon Festival for 10 years now, and now in the UK, there's about 30 of these kind of festivals uh, across the country. And I predict that one trend will be that they will continue to arrive in the next few years. Not, I hasten to add, because these events make sense financially. City festivals like this are quite tricky to run. Um, you're working with lots of small venues, your ticket price is relatively low, and it's quite difficult to get sponsorship. Um, there's a whole load of interesting things about why they're tricky, um, but I won't tell you about that now. You can ask questions at the end if that's of interest. But I believe that city festivals like this are vital to cities and to music in cities. Um, they, they help establish audiences for new artists, and they ensure that music is on the agenda of your local government and your local council and your policy makers. Festivals like Soon bring a vibrancy and a focus to music in the city in a way unlike anything else, and a reason I feel why every city should have at least one such event. I believe they're an important way to bring together the existing music industry, a bit like you're doing today, in any local area, um, and they also excite and they encourage people to come and get involved into the industry. And they also give a city or a town a sense of place and a sense of identity. Five years ago, um, so five years, into, five years ago, but also far, halfway into running uh, the festival, it felt like a natural step for us to start promoting concerts. Um, two things were happening. First, I was being asked by live agents, people who represent uh, most of the more established artists in the UK. They were asking me if I could put on shows at other times in the year because they needed a promoter in Cardiff, which is the city where I live, who was willing to book emerging artists and someone who had a network, a local network of new music fans who were able, uh, you know, and I was able to kind of bring people out to see new, someone new. Sometimes the people that we were putting on were completely unknown. The other thing that I'd noticed was that over the first few years of the festival, some of the acts that I'd put on at Soon had, in, in very small bars and small clubs, had gone on to play much bigger rooms. Um, bands like, which they might not, you might not know them, but over, over in the UK there became bigger bands, bands like Ben Howard, Disclosure, Marina and the Diamonds, Foxes, Wolf Alice, and we even, at our very first event, put on a young lady to 60 people. She was called Adele. So I thought we wanted to be involved in that. So I now promote around 100 concerts a year, uh, mostly in Cardiff, um, though I do other shows around Wales. I work a lot with new artists, uh, often bringing them to Wales for the first time. And then I hope that I get to continue working with them uh, if for those that sort of end up stepping up to larger spaces. And it's this element of live music that I'm going to focus on, because uh, I want to kind of tell you a story, which is sort of, hopefully as I tell it, it will um, explain some trends that are happening uh, in the UK, um, some of the structure and some of the names of the people involved in the UK, but also some of the problems we've got and how we might um, fix them. So let's start where it all begins, with a brand new emerging artist playing in a small venue. Um, and we have thousands of 
new artists in the UK, uh, thousands of young and new bands and singers and songwriters who want to go out and play their songs. I think there's, I believe there's more than now than ever because the barriers to making music, uh, recording your music, uploading your music in some form and, and it being heard uh, are le you know, less than ever. It's easier than ever. Um, and most people who make music want to play live. So they get their songs out and then they're looking for their, their first show. Um, and they start in these small venues, uh, which we call it in the UK grassroots venues. Grassroots venues are small venues. Perhaps they hold 50 people, perhaps they hold 200 people. Um, they are local places and spaces all across the United Kingdom where bands get to play their first shows. But over the past decade, we've begun to see the collapse of our grassroots music circuit in the UK. In the past 10 years, London has lost 40% of its grassroots music venues. And they're closing kind of everywhere around the country. Fortunately, two things have happened which have slowed that decline. There is a week-long initiative called Independent Venue Week. And it was established where for seven days each spring, grassroots venues in the United Kingdom would come together and would be celebrated. Big acts returned to the small venues where they first played uh, before they became famous. Our media and stories uh, about the current issues that the venues have. And radio DJs will tour the country talking to the people and the characters who run these venues and the people who also come out to support their local venues. The other thing that has happened was that in 2014, as all these venues were closing, one venue owner, a man called Mark David, set up a new organization, which is called the Music Venues Trust. And it brought together small UK venues and he, to demand that something was done to protect them. Indeed, I'm actually only using the term grassroot venue because Mark and his team at Music Venues Trust worked hard to bring this term, grassroot venue, into popular use. Before that, we all used to talk about our small venues as the toilet circuit, because they were very small and they often smelt of we. The Music Venues Trust lobbies, campaigns, and shouts about the issues that affect small venues. And on that first slide that I, you couldn't see, the Music Venues Trust are one of the partners that, that work uh, around live music in the UK. Um, they shout about issues that affect small venues, particularly around licensing, noise abatement, and proposals where new building developments might impact upon an existing venue. Together, the work that Independent Venue Week and Music Venues Trust have undertake, bringing these issues before our government into policy and into action, have been vital. In London, it prompted our former mayor to set up an emergency task force, which has succeeded in stemming the closure of venues. It's not by any stretch solved the problems, but it has highlighted how important these grassroots venues are to the cultural offer of a city and to the local economy. But as importantly, it's in these tiny grassroots venues that are vital to our global music industry. Okay, so a recent, we have a, a news publication in the UK for the industry called Music Week, and a recent Music Week investigation revealed that in 2016, there were 19 acts who finally got to headline at arena level in the UK. So just for clarity, a UK arena might be a venue that holds between about 6,000 and 12,000 people. So um, in 2016, 19 bands finally got to play a headline sh show at an arena for the first time. This was a record amount of bands that had made their debut at arena, um, which is very exciting. But I took a look at this list, and I, um, 
I, I sort of wondered how many of these bands kind of just arrived big and how many of them had worked their way up through grassroots venues. So of the 19, these are the bands that started in grassroots venues. 11. So over half of the people that have got to the top, because the arena's kind of as big as you can kind of go, um, over half of them had started in small venues and in grassroots venues. In the same report that Music Week published, they calculated that it takes an average of five years for an artist to go from a grassroots venue or to start out to get to an arena. Some do it really quick, Adele, some take a long time. Catfish in the bottom. Um, so we've got five bands need, needing five years to establish themselves, five years of wanting to find an audience. Um, and that to me paints a pretty bleak future. Because if grassroots venues are closing, that means the opportunities for new emerging artists to be able to play are diminishing which means that ultimately we'll have less headliners emerging in the future. In fact, in the, this particular period when these, so in the five years that these bands were moving out of the grassroots and moving into the arenas, um, was the exact same time that um, all those venues were closing. So they were kind of playing in the grassroots venues and moving on and then literally they were kind of closing behind them. Um, I've just pressed the button that I don't know what I've done. Okay, so why is this happening? So let's look at the structure of how shows are promoted pretty much in the UK. Um, starting out, you have tiny letters, you have your emerging artists playing in your grassroots venues um, at the bottom. Then you have local promoters, uh, then national promoters, and then global promoters. Uh, in terms of their e sort of economic clout, the size of their companies, they look like that. Big companies right down to tiny little people who are probably not earning anything at all or very, very little. Um, at a local level, in a, perhaps across a town or a city, you'll have one or you'll have many local promoters. That's what I do. Some, someone who books lots of shows into lots of different venues across the city, who's usually based in the city where they work. Um, there's no official numbers actually as to how many local promoters there are in the UK, but I know about 90 different companies. Some are as small as turning over about 50,000 pounds a year. The biggest ones turn over between about six million and eight million, so you kind of get a sense of their size. And then you have national promoters. Um, and there's just a handful of national promoters, music promoters in the UK. Um, so some names if you don't know them. SJM, who are the biggest. DF Concerts, Kilimanjaro, DHP, Crosstown Promotions, all being names to look out for. And these companies promote across the whole of the UK, mostly uh, in venues from between about a thousand people right up to arenas and stadiums at 50,000 or 60,000 people. And these companies turn over 15 million to about 100 million pounds. So you get a sense of the size for them. Until recently there was another national promoter called Metropolis, but they've just effectively been bought out by Live Nation, who are one of the global promoters. Um, and you've got the likes of Live Nation, a company called Global, uh, AEG or Golden Voice as they're more commonly known in the UK. So you could kind of look at the structure like this. You've got thousands of people at the bottom, hundreds of small venues, 90 or whatever, we don't know, the number of local promoters, a handful of national promoters, and then I can count them on a hand, in fact without using my thumb, the global promoters. And I don't think this structure works anymore. I think it's causing the problems. The first reason why is because when it comes to promoting these new artists, um, these shows are now almost being entirely done by the small venues and the local promoters. 
the national promoters um, have pretty much stopped promoting in our small venues. Uh, why? Well, because putting on small shows means um, small numbers of people. It means you know, 50 to 200 people at most. You, you, you lose money as much as you make money. Uh, and there's, there's, you've got to do all of the admin. There's a lot of admin around something. So they've just, over the past five, six years, they've just kind of walked away from, from doing it and left it to the venues and left it to local promoters. Um, here's an example. This is our main small venue in Cardiff. This is where, this is the must play venue in Cardiff. Club E4 Back, Little Ivers Club. So last year they had, uh, how many, I can't do my maths, 163 concerts last year. Um, 123 were promoted by different local promoters. 34 were promoted by the venue itself. And six were promoted by the national promoters. So basically, all the other national promoters together only put on six shows into that small venue. And this would be okay if local promoters who put on these acts, because they're the biggest sort of people putting it on, were able to keep the bands as the bands got bigger. But they don't. At the same time that the national promoters have moved out of promoting in the small venues, um, they've actually started grabbing the bands to work with much earlier on. So as soon as the bands kind of emerge out the smallest venues, they used to let them grow up to like 1,000 or 2,000 people before they really got involved. Um, but now they're grabbing them as soon as they emerge from a 200 or 300 cap venue, they, they kind of take them off the local promoters or they take them off the venue itself. And to be fair to the national promoters, that's happening also because the national promoters are having the same kind of squeeze from the global promoters. National promoters in the UK used to be able to hang on to bands all the way to the top. Um, but now, there's pressure from global promoters, so national promoters are either losing bands that they would normally work with, or they're having to co-promote with global promoters with acts that they've taken. So they're being squeezed, and they in turn are squeezing the people below them, but ultimately all of that squeeze, the thing that it's hitting is the grassroots venues at the bottom. The same thing, or something similar, is happening in festivals. There's been a huge growth of music festivals in the UK, driven partly by the rise of what we call boutique festivals, and that's smaller festivals with an audience of a few thousand people or up to 20,000 people. And also um, by the growth of streaming, which has enabled people to discover new bands and they still have an appetite to want to go and see them. Festival goers in the UK used to just go to one festival a year, but a bit like buying records, they now go, the average is now more than two. The other thing that's happened is the entertainment company Global entered, entered the festival market two years ago and is now the second largest festival operator in the UK behind Live Nation. So in two years, they've gone from nothing to owning Field Day, Festival Number no. 6, Snow Bombing, Snow Bombing in Austria, Southwest 4, Electric Elephant, Lost Village, Boardmasters, Why Not, Truck, Stand and Calling, Rewind, Kendall Calling and Victorious, which is a list of great festivals to go and play, by the way. Um, so now they're the second biggest operator. Um, and I'm on the board of an organization called the Association of Independent Festivals. We look after uh, as what's remaining of all of the independent festivals in the UK, about 60, 65 festivals. And we've seen nine of our festivals bought out by Global in the last two years. It's like a, a really good shopping trip. So what is now happening in the festival market is you've got two big operators, Global and Live Nation, and they are slugging it out with each other. They are putting in much bigger fees for artists, and but whilst they do that, they're also kind of in increasing their grip on, on a thing we call exclusivity, like where an act can and can't play. And that's moving, where it used to be the headliner, we'll have the headliner exclusively, it's going down and down and down the bill. Um, so they're saying that smaller and smaller acts can't play other festivals. And that is um, causing a huge effect on the independent venues, uh, independent festivals, which are kind of like our grassroots venues. They're much smaller and they're the places where 
you know, acts would normally run around and see, um, play lots of little festivals. And it's having an effect on our independent festivals because they can't afford the fees now that, uh, because all the fees are going up and independent festivals are expected to pay the same kind of fees, but they can't afford it. But also they can't get some acts anymore because they're being, uh, the exclusivity clause is being applied further down. So it's causing real problems um, in the festival market too. And I'm not sure how that's all going to play out because it's only just happening. It could be that Live Nation and Global slug it out. We don't know wh where that's going to go. Um, so we're just going to have to wait and see um, you know, whether fe our festivals will be OK or whether they'll start to close. Uh, certainly, I've seen a slow in the growth of new festivals. But we'll have to, it'll, over the next couple of years, that'll kind of play out. But so I'm not sure where it's going to go for festivals. But for concerts, I actually think the future could be quite exciting. The particular structure that I was talking about before of national promoters and local promoters has been in place f since the early 1990s. So it's the best part of almost 30 years. And it suited the industry really well back then when record sales were really high and artist fees were very low. But that's no longer the case. So I no longer think that that model is fit for purpose. So I think we're going to see a fundamental change in the next two years. And if not, sorry. I think we're going to go, I hope we're going to go, global local. What I hope that will happen in the next couple of years is we'll actually see the coming together of either a national promoter or the global promoters with our grassroots and local promoters at the bottom. I would not be surprised if Live Nation, who some people think of as the baddies, but I would not be surprised if it was actually Live Nation who were the first one to do a deal with all of our local promoters in each region in the UK, promising to keep them involved as co-promoters as artists gets bigger. That's because Live Nation not only need to ensure that they've got new artists emerging at arena level, um, but they also own a lot of the venues where these acts play. So they've got a lot of interest in making sure that new artists are coming through. And also, if you think about it, this simple offer to local promoters uh, and grassroots venues will secure that they, uh, that they keep those artists coming through and they keep, this, they keep the small companies involved who are taking a risk on all of these new artists all the time. Um, and it will keep grassroots venues open. Um, but it will do happen without Live Nation actually having to acquire any companies or buy any infrastructure. So you've got a parallel with what's going on in the festival market. Global are having to spend, 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 spend to, to become so big. And Live Nation are also buying things up to try and compete. But maybe the solution here is not to spend money. It's just to do a deal with the people um, at the bottom. So that's my kind of vision. It's not a pipe dream because actually those relationships do happen from time to time between global or national promoters and the smaller local promoters around the UK. In one of my early years of running Soon Festival, um, I've done some, something there. Technically, this isn't going well, is it, guys? <laughs> um, I booked a new band to play a small venue, but the band had to cancel uh, before I could announce them. The agent said he'd owe me, and uh, that was seven years ago. And then a couple of months ago, uh, they re the band repaid the favor, and this was the show. Uh, the band was the XX. And we did this show. It was a, we're a local promoter, uh, and we did this show with a national promoter called SJM. Um, it, it rarely happens at this level, but it does happen. Um, and that means I feel that that's like a promising future because it, it's not something that we can't realize and feel. And it works for everybody. It works for the nationals and it works for us at the local level and it works for the grassroots venues. And I, I hope that this becomes common practice because it gives the opportunity to truly connect a local music industry with the global music industry all without having to leave your town. It means people in a town or city can find their way into the industry through the small venues, but get to work 
on shows all the way up to the biggest level without having to move to another place. It means that some of the money from the big shows trickles down to help support local bands and grassroots venues. And it helps us continue to support new emerging music, which is a thing that I absolutely love doing, as I'm sure you do too. Um, so I hope there's a good future. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I have some of my questions. And then we will ask questions from audience. Перевод идет, да? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, у меня первый вопрос, он, yes. он практически uh, к тебе как к организатору фестиваля uh, Sun, Sun Festival. Uh, где, на твой взгляд, золотая середина между... Uh, тем, чтобы работать с топ-артистами, которые стоят очень дорого и делают крутое шоу, и молодыми начинающими артистами, выступление которых это всегда риск. Может прийти недостаточно людей, и, или само шоу может быть не таким крутым. Где найти середину, формируя лайнап фестиваля? Um, well, it, it's actually much easier in a fest. I, I find it easier. I find it easier in a festival because um, we, with it, with the festivals that we run, we particularly we don't really try and book any big acts. So we actually try and stay away from bigger acts. We used to book bigger acts, and we realised that that was a mistake, because if you book bigger acts, um, you you grow an audience where some of that audience or quite a lot of that audience is only interested in those people at the top and they're not interested in the rest and that's not the that's fine but that's not the festival that we wanted to run we wanted a festival where people came because perhaps they didn't know any of the acts but they trusted us to pick really good ones that they would like so we kind of started by getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and then started booking bigger acts. And then we realized that it wasn't working how we wanted. Like People were sort of moving to different places and not watching certain bands. And actually, bigger acts come with all of the problems I mentioned before. Bigger fees, more demands. Um, just you know, not always such a nice environment. So we cut the festival right down, made it actually, like, absolutely slash the capacity made it really small and then just focused on small bands and actually increasingly for a while it was almost like a game tried to like if my wife didn't know any of the bands I was really pleased and she'd get annoyed to be like I don't know anyone playing the bill and I'd be like that's a good sign because then she would go obviously and um, she's my wife I have to give her a free ticket and she would come home with records of bands that she'd discovered um, so you have to think, of, for us, it's about thinking about your audience and nurturing that, that kind of audience. It's not necessarily all about having big numbers. Sometimes it's better to stay small, but have a really good quality audience, like you guys. Thank you. Еще вопрос. Я был на твоем профиле на LinkedIn. Если верить данным, которые там указаны, то в этом месяце вы празднуете 10 лет фестивалю. Хочу поздравить с этим. И вопрос касается еще один вопрос, который касается фестиваля. Я согласен с тем, что воспитывать аудиторию, показывать новые имена. Это очень важная, очень важная функция фестиваля. Но не менее важная функция открывать и новых музыкантов. Могли бы вы назвать артистов, которые сегодня уже известны, которых знают, возможно, даже в Украине, которые э, выступали на старте своего пути на фестивале Сун? Адель. 
В, ко в каком году? And it was like, this is great. Like, it's not, you know, this is great. It's not, this is fine. This is like, let's do it. It's good. And 60 people were in the room and it was really nice. And we went to see it. Had no idea that she would, you know, you know we book loads of artists that we think are great. And some of them just, you know, they stay where they are. And some of them nobody ever gets interested in. And some of them become huge. And you, I, I mean, I'm the worst person to ask. Because I'll watch the bill and go like, these guys are going to be huge. Uh, Alt J, I remember watching Alt J. I don't know if they're well known here, but I remember watching Alt J in the pub uh, at soon, and it was just full, like literally just you know 110 people. That was what the room held, and I thought they were great, but I just thought they were great, and they would be mellow, and that would be it, and they would be like you know maybe they get a little audience, and they now in London they can sell 10,000 tickets, they can headline festivals. They're talking about being future headliners at Glastonbury. I, I never would have predicted that. So I'm, that's a good job I'm not in A&R. I'm terrible. Thank you. Uh, следующий вопрос, и uh, это, наверное, даже скорее совет. Я хотел бы задать его тебе именно как uh, организатору фестиваля и музыкальному менеджеру, который живет в Уэльсе. То есть в, не, не в Лондоне, не в столице, в uh, Великобритании. В Украине, в украинской музыкальной индустрии, концертной и фестивальной индустрии э, сложилась такая э, проблема. То есть у нас основное количество средств, ресурсов, талантливых, идейных людей и артистов, она сосредоточена именно в Киеве. И э, здесь, несмотря на экономический кризис в стране в целом, все, в принципе, движется вперед, активно развивается. Появляются новые фестивали, новые артисты, и, ну, и, и все довольно неплохо. Но в то же время в регионах э, страны, а страна очень большая, там все это развивается довольно медленно, а в некоторых стоит на месте. В некоторых, наоборот, даже, то есть там тенденция к тому, чтобы идти к упадку. И получается такая ситуация, когда э, предложение продукта музыкального и всего остального в столице, оно превышает спрос, который есть в остальной стране ко всему, к этому. И иногда бывают даже уже такие комические ситуации, когда артист в Киеве делает современное, актуальное, качественное, технологичное шоу, и те площадки, куда он привозит их в регионах, они просто ну, не соответствие между этим всем. И ты как промоутер из Уэльса, который сделал именно в Уэльсе такой фестиваль, какой ты мог бы дать совет, возможно, каких-то искусственных э, методов стимулирования концертной, клубной, музыкальной, культурной жизни в других регионах, не в столице. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. You, you have to, you, you can't copy what's going on elsewhere, you know. So you, it's true. You, you'll have a capital city like London uh, or Kiev, where Only there can certain things happen because it's a, you know, it's, it, London is a lot of people, it's a busy place, it's where the headquarters of the major companies are, it's got an international airport or three, you know. So only certain things can happen there. Um, and where you live, if you live like I live somewhere else, um, you can't be the same as that. Um, And some of, the, some of the things that do really well in London won't do well where I am. And, and sometimes the opposite way around. And the best thing that you can do is, is try and get a sense of your city or your place and play to its strengths. And then if you really want something to happen that doesn't happen, go for it, try it. Uh, but if it doesn't spark up, then maybe you're just the only person that's really interested. Um, And hopefully then what you end up with is, if you think about it the other way around, if you're sitting in London or you're sitting in Kiev, suddenly if, if somewhere else looks, you know, isn't the same as you, 
um, you know, like Wales is full of hills and trees and mountains and London isn't. Um, and then we look exciting and interesting in a different way. And people want to come to us for different reasons. So they're not going to come to us to launch their album because we've got no media there. There's no headquarters of promoters there. They're going to do all of that in London. Um, our airport isn't very good, you know, but they're going to come to us for other things. They come to us for festivals. We're really good at festivals. We've got some of the best festivals in the UK. I would say we've got the best festivals in the UK. We have got the best festivals in the UK. Green Man Festival, festival number six, Fire in the Mountain, tiny little festival that Radiohead go to because it only holds a thousand people, but they go there because it's, I've spoiled the secret, it's so amazing. Um, so you have to sort of think like that and don't get frustrated or angry if you're not doing the numbers. So one of the problems that I have as a promoter, I'll be booking a band and the agent will tell me, I don't know what your equivalent will be, but they'll be say, um, such and such is worth two Brixton Academies. So Brixton Academy is a 5,000 capacity venue in London. So they'll tell me, I'm trying to book somebody and they'll say, well, she's worth two Brixton Academies. Well, that means nothing to me. I live in Cardiff. They're worth a pub around the corner. And it takes quite, and, and we know our, you know your place. You know your town and your region better than somebody who doesn't live there. And sometimes it's a, a discussion to try and help people understand um, what your place is like and, and be honest about it. So I know, for example, that certain acts would play in London, not all acts, um, but cer certain acts will do one third of the tickets that London will do for certain emerging acts. And I know that because we've made the mistake of expecting to do the same or half. And we can tell an agent or a manager, this is what we're going to do. And we're not always right. But seven or eight times out of ten, we are right. And sometimes if they play Manchester, I'll go, we're worth half of Manchester. Because I know. And you just have to build up relationship where people trust you to be right and trust that you know your stuff. Thank you. Questions from the room, I think, can go. We're going to keep moving this way till I'm eventually off the stage. <laughs> I'm going to sit here. Uh, hi, John. Uh, my name is Karen. First of all, I, want, I would like to thank you for interesting and very thoughtful presentation you did. So, and uh, going back to business questions of concert promotion and uh, concert org organization business. I'd like to ask you a few questions regarding hedging of uh, risks. Uh, you know, it's a very risky business, it's understandable, and uh, in any case, every promoter takes a huge, uh, big risks every time he books someone, book the venue, he has to put some advance payments, so he risks. So, uh, what do you think regarding hedging this? What, uh, how you find this equilibri equilibrium between uh, supply and demand? Uh, how you find uh, this particular amount of audience who will come to particular act? I mean, what yes, do you think? that's a good question. I don't know how your deals are done over here. Actually, it might be quite interesting. So, in the UK, broadly speaking, for an established act or, or you know. Um, so when we were negotiating with an agent, we would um, be expected to pay a fee of a certain amount um, versus 80% of the box office receipts. So um, is that how you would do it? Depends on the deal, from deal to deal. Oh, okay. Uh, so, okay, so in the UK, it's normally, so you kind of send them a budget and say, I'm going to pay for production, marketing, tickets, staff. You send them a budget um, and then you offer a, 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 um, a fee, which quite often is based on 
selling out the venue or close to selling out the venue. Um, and then, depending on how the sales do, you'll either pay them the fee. So if it doesn't do very well, you've still got to pay them the fee. And yeah, if it sure. does well, that's you've, what got to, I'm talking about. you've got to pay them um, 80%, so the, which might be the fee plus some more. But I'm sort of so it's I should have bought a budget I, I could you know to show you how it works. But that used to be that eighty percent is now eighty five percent or ninety five percent or ninety seven and a half percent. Or if you're the Rolling Stones, it's a hundred and twenty percent. So the so the promoter who puts on the Rolling Stones, I don't know if this happens all the time, but it definitely happened in London. But the promo, who whoever's fault this was, the promoter paid a hundred and twenty percent of the box office which is ludicrous, obviously, because they're losing out. And the point about saying that is that that squeeze, those deals used to be, if you read your history, used to be just a fee, and then they became 50% of the door, and they've increased and increased and increased. And sometimes for good reason, but quite often not, because my point about the presentation is that sometimes you're just looking at that show, and, and there's somebody going, what, what money can I make out of that show? But they're not thinking about the impact that you know, if the promoter loses money, the promote, where does the promoter make that money back up? You know, if there's no space to make it up in the back, the next show, or if the venue loses money, you know, that's the venue that you need to 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 go into. So you 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 you've, there isn't enough thinking about that kind of bigger picture. So the risk taking, you know, um, promoters take. I think when a new artist goes on the road, everybody's taking a risk, you know? The, the, the artist is getting paid very little, so they're giving up their time and their job, and, you know, the manager isn't making any money or not taking any money. The agent isn't taking any money. You know, the venue, if 20... Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, Ellie's right. The agent is taking a commission. The agents always get paid. Um... You know, and the venue, I mean, imagine if there's 30 people, let's say we put a concert on tonight and 30 people came, everybody's losing money, including the venue, you know, um, and that's a real problem. As you get, so you're always taking that kind of risk, but as you get bigger, promoters are increasingly just starting to look like banks, really. They're just another way, when you're doing a deal, so when we did the XX, it was 85%, um, which, is, which was reasonable. Um, I think, you know, I, I would obviously rather it was less, but 85% is okay. In London, it was 95 or 97.5%, or it was going to be. And that's just unmanageable. You're basically like a really bad bank, lending money out at a really bad rate, and you might not get it back. So, yeah, so that's broadly how our... Um, so, in any case, it's some kind of bet every time, Yeah. It's all, yeah, it's always a bet. And that's the thing. The agent might say, oh, they're worth this over here, but they might not be worth that with you. Um, you, 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 can, you can, yeah, there's always... Sometimes it works the other way. You know, absolutely works the other way. You, 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 you put somebody on and you quite like the music. I put on a band called Nothing But Thieves that every other... I never dealt with this agent before. And this agent came to me with this band and it's not really my kind of music, very rocky. But I kind of liked it. And I was like, why have you come to me? And she was like, everybody else has turned me down, right? She knew like three other promoters in Cardiff. And I was like, why not? We put them on in a little bar. We offered them, you know, it was like 100 people that sold out. They're now like worth 2,000, 3,000 people. Um, I never would have guessed that, you know? And that happens a lot. So it does, it's great when it happens that way for everybody. The band aren't looking for a lot of money. You know, the agent's not looking for a lot of money. But actually... Everybody does well. They're the, when you send a settlement, as we call it, in after the show, when you, can, when you send a settlement that says, here's the guarantee plus some more because we did well, I love doing that. It's the nicest thing because you've been with the band and you've seen them, you know, they're loving it or they're hating it or whatever, but you're able to give them a little bit more money. If it's £10 or £200, it's the nicest feeling. But nobody's there when you're losing money you just, nobody's there for anybody. And uh, that's, quite, that's quite tough. Thank you very much.
Thank you. John, thank you for that uh, you know, decent presentation, especially those pages with the figures. <laughs> I believe one day we're going to reach them, I mean, <laughs> Ukraine. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to go back to the topic that Alex has put, the topic about the local uh, venues and local not existing cu cultures in Ukraine. And I'd like to ask you, about some you know precise advices how to uh, how to ask one day uh, the audience in some small town like deeply in the country to come and see a concert of some unknown group uh, and not to go to a shopping mall for entertainment how to push them, you know, to do it for the first time, for the second time, for the third time. Because uh, audience, we, we all know it quite good. They are not the brightest part of that puzzle, but one of the most important uh, part well, of that puzzle. Yeah, I mean, I said in my presentation, like, you know, agents came to me because I could find an audience for bands. But actually, I'm, you know, all I'm doing is spotting you in the crowd like the people who are the people who really should get all the credit are parents and schools and if you really want to get people involved that's where you start you take bands so for example we live in a bilingual nation so we live in a welsh speaking nation and what we have in wales is uh, about half a million people who speak welsh but as they get older it's not cool to speak welsh right so you speak english um so what they started doing was taking Welsh language bands into schools, which the government paid for, and in lunchtime, a band would play. And then the kids would be watching someone that wasn't much older than them, 18, 17, 18, 19, playing instruments, singing songs, singing in Welsh. And for those kids, most of them, that was the first time they'd ever seen a concert. I don't know what it's like for you, but you know, most people's first concert is a big pop concert. So, you know, they'd never seen a band before and it's happening in their school and they can go up and touch them and they can, that sounds a bit weird, they can go and talk to them and they can buy a record and they can get an autograph and it's exciting because music is exciting, isn't it? It's physical and it's exciting. So you take it right into the schools. And some of those people, it's just a lunchtime and it's gone and they go back to the shopping malls. But some of those people, that's the start of their journey. And it might be because their parents aren't into music. So their parents aren't playing it or taking them to concerts, taking them to festivals. So some of them are. Some of them come home and say, like, I saw this band. And the, the mum or dad is like, yeah, great. You know. So you, that's the way to do it. So it's a long journey. And you're doing it for, you know, that's, we do that in Wales. We do that in Wales. And we, do, we, did, we came at it from a language thing. That was the reason to try and, help those kids think it's okay, it's cool to, cool to speak in Welsh, I can go to a concert and I can, you know, and I can write in Welsh, and it was, just, it was about a language, but accidentally what happened is it stimulated our Welsh language music scene and it continues to work. Yeah, you know, it's quite a familiar situation for us here, that bilingual, yeah. And another question, sorry, it's gonna be the last. If you want to be local, like it's your mission, you feel it's going to be okay, it's yours. But how to stay influential and become more and more influential with every new act? How to build that uh, efficient uh, connection between the promoter, between the business and the act? For them to stay close to you even when they are at arena already. I don't, I, I, sadly, I don't have the secret to that. Um, because, you know, there's, in, within our industry, it, in the old days, in the 1960s, when the Beatles were around, um, the Beatles booked shows by calling a venue and booking a venue. So back then, you know, they had the manager, so the manager called, that, that was it. There wasn't all of these other layers. There wasn't really like regional promoters and local promoters and agents, you know, that didn't exist. Um, and I can understand why it's there but you've got all of these people in between now and um, so sometimes you can have a situation where you're with a band and you know them and you've you know worked with them since day one
but you can't actually get them. They want to play the show. You want them to play the show. You've agreed it. But then there's everybody else in between who's saying no. And years ago, I worked on a big charity concert, like a big 60,000 capacity concert. And we were trying to get acts to play. And we had that problem. We had major acts, like, I can't name them, but big, big acts that we knew. And they wanted to play. And, but we were calling their agents or other people were calling their managers and they were saying no. So one of the acts just went, I'll sort this out. And he went on our national radio station, on Radio One, and he said, I'm really looking forward to playing the Tsunami Relief concert in two weeks. And the phone went and it was his agent and they played. And, you know, so I can't explain why all of that happens. You know, you can just do your best. Um, and that's why I'd like to see structures in place so it doesn't have to come about, you know, I'd like to see it as a system that, that allowed people to stay, with the, stay where they want to play. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I have a question for you. Uh, here in Ukraine, we have uh, such a problem as uh, the format of music industry. If you're a pop star or a rock star, uh, it, it is quite easy to become famous and to gather a lot of audience to your concerts. But if, you, uh, if, but if you're doing something a special, something unique, for example, I'm a member of uh, the um, a cappella group, we have uh, only one girl, a uh, female beatboxer in Ukraine. We have a girl which simulate trumpet and uh, make it as good as uh, Eric Trufas uh, told her that she is great. So, and we perform, but, um, a and a lot of producers that we met, they uh, say to us that, uh, girls, you're quite good, yeah, you make good music and it's very interesting, it's unique, but nobody will come, nobody will uh, buy a ticket to uh, something uncommon, something uh, not famous, and we make concerts like two concert, two big concerts a year. But it's very difficult. We pay uh, our money to um, have a concert hall, uh, and it's it's really difficult to gather audience. And uh, here's my question: In Britain, do you have a format of music like if you are a rock musician, so you will be cool and uh, everybody will came and if you make uh, jazz or ethno music or a cappella music uh, you um, it's it will be difficult to make an audience thank you yeah i think it's, i mean yeah uh, there's different sides of the industry you know and i'm saying industry and that's maybe a, that's part of the problem if you're looking at the music industry then industry is all always about um making money selling units you know like big numbers and so some things don't fit into that, you know. Some things are small. And music is, you know, people start writing music. They don't think about, some people think about success. I've been working with a young songwriter and he's just completely obsessed about his songs being coming famous. That's all he wants. And that's fine, but that sits over there. And there's other people who just start a band um, for no reason at all. And, but then people start to like it, and that sits over here, that's somewhere else. And you might be somewhere like that, you know? Like, you're talking to some people who are just thinking in units and structures and sales, and they might not, you know, because normally there's like a pattern of things that have come before, you look a little bit different. And people who work in big organizations or think in that way, they don't, they're used to what's been happened before and they just think that what, what's going to happen, what's going to work in the future is the same kind of thing, right? And so you have to go and speak to the people who are different and more creative and interesting. Um, and there's plenty of them about. And then what you obviously also find sometimes is the thing that got rejected all the time is actually the thing that kind of catches and does really well. Um, you know, and we have that always in the UK. Like Ed Sheeran was a kind of example, I guess, of someone that was like, didn't look like a pop star, didn't look like a famous singer. You know, everyone was telling him to get a band. And he, he refused and refused and refused and did his own thing. And, you know, um, for some reason he caught and 
now everybody wants to be Ed Sheeran, you know? And people are signing, people are working with people who look like Ed Sheeran. Um, but like, it probably won't work now. Um, so I think the thing for you is, you know, I would always say, I mean, I love festivals and I think festivals are a great space to go, particularly if you're different, because people at a festival, they're just in a, their own little bubble, in their own little world, and they're much more open to things. You know, like they're there for a weekend and they're just up for anything that's in front of them. Um, they drink a lot earlier, so they're much more relaxed and they'll go and see things that they wouldn't normally see. Trying to play shows is different. You're trying to get somebody who's maybe been at work all day or maybe been studying to think about what they're gonna do in the evening and most people, what they want to do in the evening is do something fun that they probably already know, you know? I already know that artist. I already know that film. I know something about that food. You know, it's, it's quite an ask of someone to say, after your long day of work or study, do you want to come and be challenged and do something, you know? And maybe it might be good and maybe it might not be. I'm not saying you're no good, you know? But that's a risk. And, and so actually, I, I always say to people, like, look at festivals. Because it's, you know, there's such an amazing space where all these different things happen. And in there, that's where people are just open and you can have those magical moments. And, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll find your audience that way. Thank you. Two questions, if you can. Ну, если пока нет желающих, я задам еще один. У меня было больше вопросов, я просто хотел больше времени предоставить э, зрителям аудитории. Э, у меня вопрос более широкого характера. Э, хотелось бы спросить вот о чем. Мне недавно выходила большая статья, она была посвящена тому, ну, точнее, там было большое количество примеров соб собрано в пользу того, что... Молодое поколение, поколение Y, или как его называют, миллениалы, ну, по, которые родились после там, 2000 года, и поколение Z, которое приходит им на смену, ну то есть условно аудитория там, молодая, они, их больше интересует сейчас уже не музыка и не какие-то эмоциональные переживания, сопричастность. А, э, вау-эффект. Им хочется удивляться, им хочется больше шоу, спецэффектов, э, чего-то яркого, каких-то VR-технологий и прочего-прочего. И э, я приводил там в этой статье большое количество примеров в пользу того, что многие фестивали сейчас переориентируются на то, чтобы называться Music and Tech Festivals, то есть фестивали музыки и технологий, где технологии становятся равноценным элементом, а иногда и более значимым, чем музыка. И в эту сторону движется большое количество и британских фестивалей в том числе. Причем это касается не просто молодежных веяний и трендов фестивалей каких-то коммерческих, типа там ну, Tomorrowland или Ultra Music американских вот этих вот ярких фестивалей, но и фестивалей э, нишевых, фестивалей андеграундных. Там был, например, э, пример фестиваля, он называется Latitude британский фестиваль, в котором э, проводится очень много дневных занятий, School of Noise, где молодежь работает со всякими э, экспериментальными новыми девайсами, гаджетами. И в том числе там был даже пример э, фестиваля, который называется Starmos. Он проводится в Норвегии. Его основал э, Брайан Мэй, гитарист из группы Queen, легендарный. Он э, заручился поддержкой э, многих известных музыкантов, там, своего поколения Ханс Циммер, э, Сара Брайтман, многие другие. И э, там помимо музыки, там еще проходит много лекций научных о инновациях, о каких-то эм, кибернетике и, и прочее, прочее. То есть там же на этом фестивале проводятся круглые столы, на котором участвует Брайан Ина. Бас Олдрин, космонавт американский, известный, Стивен Хокинг и прочее, прочее. То есть технологии и музыка сливаются. И в Британии это одна из тех стран, где это происходит в первую очередь. Вы видите, вы ближе к этому, чем мы. Что вы могли бы сказать по этому поводу? Да, yeah, definitely. I think um, I used the term boutique festivals, and that was kind of the start of those kind of festivals. Um, Yeah, where they not only were smaller, but yeah, they were definitely 
music was a big part of it, but it suddenly wasn't all of the focus. Um, and yeah, l like Latitude being a great example where you can go to Latitude and you can just watch music, but actually um, bringing my wife back into it, she goes just for the theatre because you get amazing theatre that starts there and you get... I mean, I never... Go, it goes back to what I was just saying now. I never go to the ballet, right? I, I'd never been to the ballet, never thought about going to the ballet. And then at Latitude, I was walking down from the campsite and I just decided to sit by this lake where there's a stage and have a coffee. And then some ballet came on and I ended up there all afternoon. And I watched ballet and contemporary dance and all of these other things uh, that I would never go out really to see and on a Tuesday night and buy a ticket. Um, and that's the joy of festivals. And we have... You know, Green Man has a whole area called Einstein's Garden, named after, obviously, Albert Einstein, which is all about science and discovery, and people spend the whole day there, particularly children, learning about stuff. There's an amazing new festival called Brainchild. It's only, like, 2,000 people, and it's, it's like, loads of it is, like, creativity and making things and getting adults to kind of be creative. And music's still a part of it, but it's a part of it. It's not, it's not all of it. And then you go, you know... Um, somebody had said recently, like, oh, we'll never see the rise of a big UK music festival again. And we've got a festival called Boomtown that was started as a kind of, like, ska, reggae, dubstep kind of mix of, you know, modern dance music and old sort of school traditions. Um, and they built a little city for 10,000 people. Um, they now have 60,000 people, and they, they build... They have like, they build the, they build it. Like, I can't explain it. They don't bring in normal production and the normal people. They build these towns, these arenas uh, that you go to and you explore and you investigate whilst you're watching bands and doing other things. And then they destroy it at the end. <laughs> and 60,000 people go. It's one of the biggest, it's now one of the biggest festivals in the UK. So people, there's a real appetite for, um, you know, not just to go and see music, to, to, to be stimulated by other things. Um, last year, there's a company that runs a couple of festivals in the UK, and they launched two new festivals last year. One was a music festival, and one was a music and technology festival. And the music festival, they had to cancel before it happened. And their other one was a huge success. And I think that kind of shows the changing patterns for, for people. Uh, thank you. Uh, спасибо. Ну, если кто-то у нас еще появился, один вопрос можем принять и будем заканчивать. Uh, hi, John. And thank you very much for coming and for your time and for your presentation. It was quite an inspiration. Uh, what I wanted to ask you, for, to you as an external person, uh, apparently coming to Ukraine, you have done some background check, maybe, of our music scene as well. What I'm wondering, is there anything in our music scene that particularly caught your attention, maybe from the previous experience, or what is done here in terms of, I don't know, like festivals, performance, maybe artists, anything that comes to your mind when it's said like Ukrainian music or Ukrainian music scene, what would you say? What would be the first? Thank you. Well, that was the thing. I didn't know. Yeah, nothing had jumped out. Like it was, um, uh, you know, there wasn't something I was like, oh, wow. I mean, I was excited to come here because I didn't know anything. And, you know, I didn't know any bands and I didn't know any festivals and I didn't know what the industry looked like. Um, and that was unusual. You know, normally when you go somewhere, there's, Like the first time I went to Norway, there was a band called Ung Dongs Gullen that I'd bought in a seven inch in a shop just because it had a B-side called Surf's Up, which is a Beach Boys track. So I'd bought this record by Ung Dongs Gullen. And then when I got invited to go to Norway, I was really excited because I was like, I might meet Ung Dongs Gullen. Uh, and I did, and I saw them, and they were brilliant. Um, but Ukraine, I didn't know anything. The only thing that, I'd, that I knew about... So there was a band that was called The Ukrainians, in the UK. I don't know if you know that. So there was a band that was, uh, so this is when I was growing up, there was a band that I was really into called The Wedding Present. And they had an offshoot band called The Ukrainians. 
uh, and they used to do covers of bands in Ukrainian. And that was the, my entire knowledge. So I've got that record. It's a lovely 10-inch single. And that was all that I knew. Um, and I don't know what that was. I think one of their members was Ukrainian or is Ukrainian. Um, and that was my way in. So that's kind of what's been enjoyable so far, is kind of learning what you've got. And um, what I really want to do is hear some bands. Um, I'd like to take some bands back, you know? That'd be my favorite bit. Thank you. Мы обязательно познакомимся с украинской музыкой тебе поближе. Будем заканчивать. Я думаю, что Джон будет доступен еще для неформального общения. Ну, у нас уже тайминг. Будем двигаться дальше. Всем спасибо.